everyone, and thank you all so much for inviting me to be here. I was really thrilled to receive the invitation because I remember back when I was working here, uh, sitting in in so many wonderful lectures that were part of the Society series, and I've been gone, you know, from the Asian for nearly 10 years now, but I have still never encountered a group of docents and educators who are as dedicated as this group, so I'm really, really honored to, to have been invited by you. Um, when, when I was asked to speak in connection with uh, the semester's theme of patronage and art, I thought Lucknow was really a perfect area on which to focus um, because it allows for really broad-ranging consideration of different patterns of patronage across a broad expanse of time and spanning diverse cultures and regions. Questions of patronage were in many ways at the heart of the exhibition um, that I co-curated in LACMA in 2010. Um, and which I hope some of you were able to see. Um, so this invitation to speak here today really allowed me to revisit some of the you know, extraordinary works in that exhibition, the personalities behind them, um, and to think uh, somewhat beyond uh, that scope of that exhibition itself um, to include uh, broader historical and art historical trajectories, like ones that were somewhat beyond the, the scope of that particular show. Lucknow was a really extraordinary city um, with a very vibrant cultural uh, and artistic life, especially in the late 18th century. This period is what I'm going to focus on today, emphasizing in particular the roles of Lucknow's various ethnically and culturally diverse patrons, especially patrons of painting. The art of Lucknow was emblematic of very intense cultural and artistic exchanges and of shifting social and cultural identities in late 18th and 19th century India um, uh, and in Britain as well. And so I'll be speaking of this material uh, in the context of late Mughal history uh, and the history in general of India's later contacts with the West and the British colonial enterprise. I'll be weaving back and forth um, at times between different periods and places, but I hope that will give you a, a better sense of the broader arenas uh, across which patronage at Lucknow became part. Okay. Let me begin with a little bit of background information for those of you who are unfamiliar with Lucknow or with India in this period. In 1775, <clears throat> Lucknow was established as the permanent capital of the province of Avad, which is now located in the North Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. And you can see uh, the region of Avad right here on this map. Uh, Avad was controlled by a series of governors um, known as Nawabs, and these governors later titled themselves as kings. Uh, until in 1856, the last king of Ovid was deposed by the British. It was two years later in 1858 that, that um, India was formally declared to be part of the British Empire. It's important to realize that Lucknow in the late 18th century was poised at an important historical junction. The late 18th century witnessed the weakening of native North Indian imperial powers. It was also a period which saw the increasing presence and power of the English East India Company in Northern India. A good deal of the artworks that I'll be showing you today um, are products of the intersection of cultures that this situation gave rise to. As you can see uh, on the map, the region of Ovid, with its capital uh, 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 at Lucknow, what is located just uh, southeast uh, of Delhi, about a third of the distance between Delhi and Calcutta. Before Lucknow became uh, the permanent capital in 1775, the seats of government in the region shifted between Lucknow and uh, a city further east called Faizabad, um, Faizabad, and I'll be referring to, to both of these sites throughout the course of my lecture. There were, uh, at Faizabad, there were a number uh, of important early paintings, uh, Indian and European, uh, that were produced. Avad here uh, was one of the administrative provinces of the Mughal Empire. The Mughals, as you know, uh, were rulers of Central Asian origin who established their rule in uh, North India in the mid-16th century 
By the early years of the 18th century, they ruled over a vast part of the Indian subcontinent, including um, parts of Afghanistan and, and well into uh, the Deccan region of South Central India, um, almost reaching uh, the southern tip uh, of the subcontinent. <clears throat> The Mughals divided the empire into various provinces that were administered under governors appointed by the emperor. Avid had been incorporated into the Mughal empire in 1580 by the emperor Akbar. For a long time, however, it remained somewhat peripheral to Mughal interests. By the early 18th century, the province uh, had become an important economic center due to its agricultural riches and also because of its importance to the extensive international trade in various Indian goods. It was also strategically located along important trade and travel routes between Delhi uh, and Calcutta. It had always been notoriously hard to govern, with local landowners always resisting Mughal imperial taxation and revenue collection, for instance. Historical records indicate <clears throat> that this led to annual armed conflicts between Mughal governors uh, and the local elites. This changed towards the mid-18th century after the Mughal emperor Muhammad Shah appointed a man named Sadat Khan as a governor of Avad in 1722. Sadat Khan would become the founder of the independent dynasty that came to rule from Lucknow until the year 1856 and which fostered much of the artistic culture that we associate with the region and this that we associate with the region and city. <clears throat> this painting from the Bodleian Library at Oxford indicates the political relationships um, that mark Avad's early history. It depicts at its center the Mughal Emperor Muhammad Shah, who ruled from the imperial capital of Delhi from the year 1719 to 48. He's shown here surrounded by four of his officials, including at the upper left side of this group, Sadat Khan. The painting is, one, uh, is by one of Shah, Muhammad Shah's leading artists, Chitarman, who's, created with having who's credited with having developed the style that was transported to Avad by other artists of the imperial atelier. Sadat Khan was a Shia nobleman who was born in Nishapur in Iran. He arrived in Delhi in 1708 following the footsteps of his father and brother. He was one of many Persian noblemen who served the Mughal emperors. Um, we have to remember that the Mughals themselves had long maintained close ties uh, with the Persian court. Persian court culture provided the model for the manners and rituals uh, of the Mughals and Pers Persian was adopted as a Mughal court language. At some points in its history, Persians constituted the largest and most powerful group among the Mughal nobility. <clears throat> After rising in the Mughal ranks, Sadat Khan was appointed in 1722 as a governor of Agra. He failed to suppress a rebellion there and his posting to Avad was in fact a punishment for his per performance in Agra. In Avad, he managed to establish control fairly quickly and was rewarded with various titles, awards, and personal wealth. The Mughal Empire at this time was um, weakening. It was under various threats from native and foreign powers. It was under uh, military and political threats from the Hindu kingdoms of the south, the Marathas, and from Afghan and Sikh uh, armies as well. This gave Sadat Khan the opportunity to assert his independence. <clears throat> Very few images exist of Sadat Khan. There are a handful, like this one, that depict him as a servant of the Mughal emperor. This painting is very much in the tradition of Mughal court portraiture showing formal meetings between uh, the emperor and courtiers and clearly articulating rank and hierarchies through the relative positions of the sitters. There's one painting, however, that depicts Sadat Khan in a different light, um, and it's this picture uh, painted in, in Faizabad in Avad uh, in the middle of the 18th century. This painting depicts Sadat Khan with uh, the minister Kandaran, who actually also appeared in the Bodleian painting. Uh, the early rulers of Avad, as I mentioned, stationed themselves at Faizabad, and this is where some of the earliest paintings associated uh, with the province of Avad uh, were produced. The circumstances of this painting are uh, unknown. What's unique about it is that it shows these two men, ministers uh, of the Mughal emperor, uh, attended by servants, one holding a white scarf um, and one holding a peacock feather 
fan. These were typically emblems that were reserved for imperial imagery, and so they're used in a portrait presumably commissioned by a governor speaks volumes about the disintegrating Mughal power in mid-18th century India. Um, I'd also like to point out here the very exuberant border, um, which links the painting to the collection of Antoine Pollier, who was one of Lucknow's most significant European patrons. The Bodleian painting is a stellar example of, of uh, the imperial Mughal style that had developed under Muhammad Shah's patronage. The style is marked by a, a taste for cool colors, whites and grays, enlivened by textiles, by a preference for symmetrical and rectilinear compositions, by a tendency to flatten volumes and compress space. Architecture is given special attention uh, in aligning the space of the picture. As you can see in this painting, um, uh, you know, where the emperor is framed, you know, by the arch, by these vertical columns, um, and by the poles of the canopy. The Faizabad painting of Sadat Khan and Khan Dauran shows the Muhammad Shah painting style as it came to be transported to the province of Avad. Note the white terrace, the, the costumes, the space, uh, the white terrace, the white, the, you know, white jamas, the white sky, um, the space defined by the rectilinear arrangement of the terrace, the carpet, um, and the canopy with its supports. Painting at Lucknow around the middle of uh, the 18th century so closely followed Mughal prototypes that it's difficult to dis distinguish between those works um, and ones produced at Delhi. This work in the Asian Art Museum collection, um, which has always been one of my favorites, uh, is a prime example of this close stylistic affinity. Um, thus, it's either you know, Delhi or Avad attribution. Like the Muhammad Shah painting, it's precisely crafted with, symmetrically com with a symmetrically composed white terrace pavilion, enlivened with colored textiles, figures, and gold highlights. These kinds of night terrace scenes um, were particular pop particularly popular in Ovid. The importation of imperial painting styles into the Mughal provinces follows a pattern similar to that in the Rajput courts. Through the service of various courtiers and princes at the Mughal court, the dissemination of paintings um, from the imperial capital by the travels uh, of artists. At Lucknow, all three of these factors come into play. <clears throat> the travel of paintings and the artists driven in this instance by the weakness of the imperial center. Uh, to put this issue into some context, it might be um, good to take a step back and discuss late Mughal painting traditions in general. Uh, it, it has really only been in recent years that late Mughal painting received its due attention from art historians. Later Mughal painting Later Mughal history in general was typically viewed through a prism of decline, one that was thought to have begun in the late 17th century with the Mughal em Emperor Aurangzeb. This decline has been attributed in some part to his religious intolerance. His Muslim orthodoxy and piety alienated both the nobility and general populace to such an extent that by the end of Aurangzeb's reign, the Mughal Empire was reeling from various uh, regional rebellions. Aurangzeb increasingly withheld his patronage from painting, among other arts, which caused a withering of the Mughal ateliers, and uh, as artists were forced to seek employment at other courts. A few paintings of exceptional quality seem to have been produced for him after he disbanded his atelier around 1668. Aurangzeb departed from Delhi in 1681 to pursue the Deccan Wars. He never returned, uh, dying in the south in 1707, so nothing is securely known of any uh, direct imperial patronage of painting uh, during the last 25 years of his reign. A very late painting, uh, which you see on the screen, by the Mughal court artist Bhavani Das, depicts Aurangzeb carried on a palanquin at a hunting expedition. Whether this painting dates from the last years of Aurangzeb's reign or the early years of his successors is unclear. Inscriptional evidence suggests that Bhavani Das was employed for some time by Aurangzeb. The artist later departed Delhi, taking up residence in the Rajasthani kingdom of Kishangar in 1719, thus effecting a transformation in the painting style uh, at, at Kishangar. 
a roughly contemporary painting by the same artist depicts the elderly Aransev in Darbar greeting a figure who has been identified as Prince Mu'azzam, the, late, the later Emperor Bahadur Shah. What's interesting for our purposes is that around the year 1770, this painting was bound into an album either in Faizabad or Lucknow uh, in Avad province for the ruler, no, ruler Nawab Shuja al Dala. Its removal from Delhi may have occurred when the imperial capital fell into disarray following its sack by the Persian invader Nadir Shah in 1739. Uh, around this time, numerous paintings, um, including such rarities as the Windsor Castle Padshah Nama manuscript, um, were dispersed from the Mughal libraries. It's possible that this dispersal began even earlier, um, during the interval between Aurangzeb's death in 1707 and Muhammad Shah's enthronement in 1719. Um, in this period, there were no fewer than five, mu five emperors who assumed the Mughal throne. Um, it's because of what we know about um, decreased imperial patronage during Aurangzeb's reign, the lack of any substantial body um, of imperial paintings that survive from the period between his death um, and the reign of Muhammad Shah, that scholars have paid very little attention to late Mughal painting traditions. <clears throat> Another painting that came to be bound up in the same album uh, of Nawab Shuja al Dalla is his portrait of Aurangzeb, which dates from around the same time that work was halted on um, his regnal history in around 1668. Clear evidence of the painting's 18th century history at Lucknow resides in its uh, reworked background. The vista of um, receding plains and, and hills dotted with small trees <clears throat> was a signature characteristic of the Delhi trained artist Meher Chand, who worked for various patrons in Avad, um, particularly for Antoine Pollier from the 1760s to uh, about 1780. And um, we're gonna look at some of Meher Chand's work in more detail later. Images such as these were among <clears throat> the various visual sources available in Avad for patrons and artists there the dispersal of paintings from Delhi would have resulted in such portrait models finding their way to regional capitals such as Lucknow, as with the, you know, the movement of artists together with their model books, sketches, and visual memories. Um, before we turn to um, the manner in which sub such imperial models came to be copied and transformed, let's return to Ovid um, and discuss the historical situation in the 18th century. <clears throat> back to this image. Um, as, as I've already mentioned, the Mughal Empire in the early 18th century was under threats from various native and foreign powers, from, um, from the Hindu kingdoms of the south, from the Afghans, um, and from the Sikhs. This gave Sadat Khan the opportunity um, to assert his independence. And one of the ways he did this um, was by appointing his own successor. He chose his nephew and son-in-law, Safdar Chung, who ruled Avad from 1739 to 1754. The uh, appointment of Mughal governors, uh, uh, provincial governors up to this point um, had been the prerogative of the Mughal emperor. When Sadat Khan appointed Safdar Jang as his successor, he thereby established the foundation for a dynastic state. Sadat Khan died in 1739, shortly after Delhi uh, had been invaded by Nadir Shah. <clears throat> Uh, Nadir Shah's sack of Delhi uh, precipitated a period of chaos in the imperial capital, and this continued through the death of the emperor, Muhammad Shah himself, in 1748, after which the, uh, the, the Mughal emperors in Delhi were basically puppets of various competing factions at court. <clears throat> this disarray in Delhi was the primary reason for Ovid's great efflorescence in the late 18th century. Various courtiers, artists, singers, and dancers uh, fled to Lucknow to seek new patronage. Not all of them were thrilled, however, about having to leave Delhi, which many considered to be their home and the cultural epicenter of uh, India in the 18th century. Several poets who transferred their homes from Delhi to Lucknow considered it a misfortune and addressed this in their poetry. Um, <clears throat> one of these poets is um, Mir Taki Mir, who left Delhi in the 1780s uh, and spent nearly 30 years in Lucknow. Um, and he wrote very bitterly about his forced exile. 
um, in one of his verses, he writes, far better than Delhi, were the ruin, far better than Lucknow, were the ruins of Delhi, would that I had died there, than let my madness lead me here. Other poets became reconciled to Lucknow after having moved there. So um, one of these, by the name of Mir Hassan, um, called Lucknow uh, in a prison house when he arrived there in 1779. And he described his journey um, to Lucknow in terms of a lover being separated from, uh, from his beloved. He wrote, since the time Hindustan was shattered, my destiny took me east. My heart was attached to Delhi and it was difficult to be separated from it. That image is still present in my eyes, like a stone embedded in a goblet. Even though I left the place, still the fact of separation tortures me. I have traveled in a carriage helplessly trapped like a bird in a moving cage, like a bird in a moving cage. Though I moved from one stage to another, my heart was left behind at each station. So he's writing that in 1779, but a few years later, um, in 1784-85, Mir Hassan had become reconciled to Lucknow. <clears throat> and he wrote, um, he wrote a poem, he wrote in a poem, how to tell you the extent of the city. It is like Isfahan, as good as half the world. Its whiteness, wonderful to look at, is such that it seems the bricks have turned into marble. How should I describe the grandeur of the fort? The mountain seems to droop on seeing its height. The palace here was the abode of light. Luxury and splendor always flourished there. Interestingly, a similar kind of ambivalence to the provinces seemed to have held sway with the early Nawabs of Lucknow. While they were keenly interested in establishing their, their um, sovereignty from Mughal dominion, they nevertheless considered Delhi to be their home. Both Sadat Khan and Safdar Jung maintained their primary residence in Delhi at a palace which had formerly belonged to the Mughal prince Dara Shiko. Uh, Dara Shiko was the presumptive heir to Shah Jahan until his defeat by um, his brother Aurangzeb, who assumed the throne instead. Dara Shiko's palace was given to Sadat Khan by the Emperor Muhammad Shah. The building is no longer extant, and the earliest surviving depictions we have of it are contained in a series of large-scale studies done for Jean-Baptiste Chanty, a Frenchman who lived for several years in Faisabad. This folio, um, which shows part of that palace, uh, part of Safdar Jung's palace at, at, at Delhi, um, comes from a series of 24 large-scale architectural studies that were produced for Chanty by an architect who worked for the third ruler of Avad, Nawab Shuja al-Dawla. Shanti was a major patron at Lucknow, um, as we'll see. He, he came to India as a French military officer in 1752. He served initially in a, a region uh, of south central India known as the Deccan. Uh, we have to remember that the French and British at, uh, since the early 1600s have been battling each other around the globe for um, you know, imperial supremacy, and the, the competition really reached its climax in the mid-18th century when the French were defeated by the British, both in North America and in India. The French forces in India were largely concentrated um, in the south, and uh, they were defeated by the British at Pondicherry in 1761. Uh, after 1761, Shanti traveled north and eventually ended up um, in the service of Shuja al-Dawla. He became a close in, uh, advisor and friend of the Nawab, um, for whom he conducted several successful negotiations with the British in 1765. Shanti left India in 1775. He reached France with his family in 1778 and presented a large part of the collection of manuscripts and paintings that he had acquired in India to King Louis XVI and these were deposited in the Royal Library, um, which is why they now all reside uh, at the Bibliothèque Nationale in, in Paris. Um, among these manuscripts were the 24 architectural drawings in, um, of buildings in Delhi, Agra, and Faisabad, from which this folio comes. <clears throat> uh, another folio from this same architectural series shows part of the Nawabi Palace at Faisabad. The early Nawabs of Avad, from Sadat Khan, um, through the reign of Shuja al-Dawla, ruled from both Faisabad and uh, 
Lucknow, as Faizabad was closer to the eastern um, part of the province while Lucknow was more centrally located. <clears throat> The early Nawab's close ties and identification with the Mughals and with Delhi um, might best be illustrated by the fact that when Safdar Jung died in 1754, his son, Shuja al-Dallah, erected his tomb not at Faizabad or Lucknow, but at Delhi. And for its form, he followed well-established prototypes for Mughal imperial tombs. This, this photograph of uh, Safdar Jung's mausoleum is in the Asian Art Museum collection. Um, as I mentioned, he was following uh, earlier Mughal prototypes for its form. Uh, the, ma the mausoleum takes that, uh, which is set in, in a Mughal-style garden, takes as its particular model the tomb that had been built in the 16th century for the Emperor Humayun. And um, here you can see both of those side by side. The Safdar Jung's mausoleum is not quite as large but it's nevertheless it's a, a very substantial structure and similar in its conception uh, with a central dome structure, you know, placed atop a very high plinth, a large central arch, um, you know, flanked by two-storied um, bays. The building utilizes the same sandstone, um, same red sandstone and white marble. It's not surprising that the Nawabs wished to emulate the Mughals in various ways. They were, in fact, very conscious of the need to maintain the outward appearance of being vassals of the Mughals. Throughout the course of the later 18th and early 19th centuries, while they increasingly considered themselves to be independent of the Mughals, they symbolically um, submitted to Mughal authority, observing basic formalities um, that would allow them to freely administer their, their province without reprisals from the imperial center. Uh, until 1819, when the Nawab Ghazi al-Din Haider assumed the title of King of Avad, uh, all the rulers uh, of, of Avad had carried, uh, carried out the official farmans of the Mughal emperor. They included his name on coins, minted in their realms, they had his name read out in Friday, Friday prayers, um, and they presented regular tributes to the emperor and members of the imperial family. This tomb, however, is kind of an extraordinary statement because while it allies the Nawabs of Avad with their imperial overlords in terms of its location and style and custom, it's also an obvious assertion of their aspirations to equal wealth and power. It was, and I think this is really important to note, the last large-scale tomb that was ever built in Delhi. Um, that it was erected by a governor and not by an imperial patron is telling of the shifts in patronage and art that were occurring at, at this time. Certain features of the mausoleum, such as its, its taller onion dome, um, its lighter feel, narrower proportions, cups, cusped arches, um, and other ornamental features do point in the direction of later Lucknowi architecture. So far, the works that I've shown you address late Mughal art and the close relationship between Mughal art and early patronage by um, the Nawabs of Avad. There is, in fact, very little that we know of the actual patronage of paintings by the first two, two Nawabs, Sadat Khan and Safdar Chung. The earliest evidence that we have of painting in Avad emerges during the reign of Shuja al dallah who ruled from 1754 to 75. But while Shuja al dallah was, was certainly a notable patron, it was actually European patrons, men like um, Jean-Baptiste Chanty um, and Antoine Pollier, who were most instrumental in, instrumental in fostering uh, the growth of a distinctive Avadi style of painting. Chanty, who uh, commissioned the architectural studies I showed earlier, was really a remarkable person. He was in India for more than 20 years, and during that time, he amassed an enormous collection um, of Indian courtly paintings, Persian and Sanskrit manuscripts. Um, at least some of the reason that he was able to acquire these materials was uh, the growth of Ovid as a marketplace for these kinds of goods, many of which were arriving from the imperial libraries of Delhi. Uh, these libraries um, had been looted and dispersed um, over a, a, over a period that may have begun, um, as I mentioned, you know, following the reign of Aurangzeb. Um, Janti had several of his manuscripts, Indian manuscripts, um, translated into, into French, 
which is really remarkable considering the fact that um, you know the real age of Orientalist scholarship on India you know had barely begun by this time. Shanti maintained an atelier of Indian artists who he commissioned to illustrate various books on subjects that were of interest to him. These included um, books on Indian civilization, um, um, and these included books on um, histories of the Rajas of Hindustan, um, a, a manuscript on elephants and palanquins, Persian and Indian customs and habits, portraits and costumes, Indian religion, um, and the history of the Mughals. This is a folio from um, one of his many albums, um, which illustrates uh, the political history of Ovid, um, to which Shanti was in a large part uh, witness. This particular folio depicts an important treaty negotiated by the ne negotiated by the British, both with the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II and with the Nawab of Ovid in 1765. And this is the treaty um, of Allahabad. Some of the negotiations for this treaty were conducted in Benares um, and, and in Shanti's presence. And, and this is why the treaty has such a prominent um, place in his album. The Allahabad Treaty consisted of major land concessions to the East India Company um, and the, the agreement to the stationing of company troops at Allahabad, um, as well as large annual payments to the company. A key figure uh, whose military victories led to the Treaty of Allahabad was Robert Clive, who um, is negotiating here with Shuja al Dalla, who's shown in a white chama and turban. Why were the British so interested in this particular region um, into which they intruded regularly into local politics from the late 18th through early 19th centuries and finally annexing the kingdom in 1856? Of course, it was because of the wealth that could be obtained through trade. Uh, as I was wandering through the LACMA collections uh, through LACMA the other day, I realized there were several works um, there that could speak to one especially important uh, aspect of this trade concerning uh, Indian textiles. Textiles from India had been exported uh, into Europe and into Southeast Asia from a very early period. One such example is this printed cotton men's robe. The textile from the southern Indian Coromandel coast was typical of the types of early textiles that were imported into Europe in great numbers, first under the Portuguese and later by other European trading companies. The development of textile print uh, industries in Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries was very closely linked to the introduction of painted cotton textiles from, from India. Europeans were drawn to Indian chintzes and calicos for their colors and exotic designs and were sending specific patterns for weaving to India as early as the late 17th century. The establishment of trading companies by the Dutch, French, and English facilitated a great market in Indian cloths and textiles that accounted for a significant part of their revenues. At some points during the 18th century, the Indian textile trade accounted for more than half of these companies' profits. Embroidered wool textiles from Kashmir, as seen in this boy's dress, were also favored in Europe, but they, they weren't quite so favored, however, um, as cashmere shawls. And I've just pulled these two examples from the Asian Art Museum's collection. These cashmere shawls were worn with a variety of costumes. In the, in the mid-19th century, there was a, a great demand, and, and in the mid-19th century, there was great demand for them. As with the dyed uh, chintzes and calicos, the shawls created a dialogue between Eastern and Western textile traditions. Cashmere designs um, ended up influencing in imitation shawls that were manufactured in Europe. And European designs, meanwhile, were given to weavers in India so they could produce specific things for the, the Western market. They were also stitched into gowns, as in this famous painting of the Empress Josephine, which incorporates a Kashmiri panel into the lower part of her dress, while another one is draped across her shoulders. The French Revolution revived the fashions and hairstyles of ancient Greece and Rome into what has come to be known um, as a neoclassical fashion or uh, empire style. Thin white muslin sheaths or fabrics um, 
for empire style gowns were imported from India, while cashmere shawls, you know, were often worn for um, warmth and color. This, uh, what I'm showing you here is an empire style gown made of cotton in India for the European market. And in case you're wondering why I digressed um, so widely from our immediate subject, it was to return to this commodity, um, the raw cotton and the cotton piece goods that became the major trade item at Lucknow. Lucknow and its hinterlands were centers for cotton cultivation, and Lucknow itself was also an important place for the collection of cotton before these shipments were sent to be exported to ports in Calcutta. Its strategic location in this regard was important. Although it was known for other um, goods like indigo and opium, cotton came to be the material that the British were most interested in. And that information might you know, provide you with uh, some context for this painting in the Asian Art Museum collection by William Simpson, a British artist who traveled to India in 1859 to provide a pictorial reportage in the aftermath of, of the 1857-58 rebellion. Among his scenes of you know, key sites of resistance and British victories, he also sketched various monuments and produced documentary scenes like this one showing cotton transport. Into the 19th century, beautifully worked cottons from Lucknow were imported into Europe as well. This um, is a dress that was fashioned out of um, fabric with, with silver metal embroidery on it. That's the, the fabric is thought to come from Lucknow where this tradition um, of embroidery was known as kamdani. Um, and here you just see some details uh, of that very fine embroidery work. Um, as with the Indian printed textiles and the cashmere shawls, um, these embroidery uh, traditions were quickly imitated by European manufacturers. So here you see uh, a European dress with imitation Kamdani work that was produced in the late 18th century. Um, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm sorry to have sort of gone <laughs> far off, you know, the topic of the painting with which we began our discussion, but, but I thought it was really interesting to just kind of see the various ways that Indian objects were coveted, um, utilized, copied, and transformed when they arrived in Europe. And I also wanted to indicate through these kinds of works, you know, why the British had took such a keen interest um, in India and um, such uh, a strategic interest in Ovid. So these are just details of the, that imitation embroidery. Um, so let me now go back to the subject of Jean-Baptiste Chanty. Chanty Jean, specifies in his memoirs that he gifted 133 Indian manuscripts to Louis XVI when he returned to France. Um, in addition to 14 volumes of Indian courtly paintings and other works such as his architectural studies. So several of these um, also seem to have been dispersed sometime between you know, his departure from India and, and arrival in France, so this album actually ended up at the V&A. Um, there are some really, really interesting ways in which Jeanty's patronage um, and life between India and France affected really interesting innovations in the arts uh, at Lucknow. There are several important paintings um, that were produced in Avad by the English artist Tilly Kettle. Kettle was one of the first professional uh, English artists to travel to India. He um, arrived there in 1769. He was followed by several other artists, all of whom went to India to seek patronage um, among the wealthy colonial elites who by this time constituted sizable populations in cities like Madras and Calcutta, um, Delhi, uh, Lucknow. In 1771, Kettle went to Faizabad at the request of the Nawab Shuja al-Dawla, and he worked there for a little over a year. He produced several paintings for the Nawab, um, eight of which we can um, trace today, um, and three of which, you know, the ones that, that I'll be showing you here, uh, we were able to include in our Lucknow exhibition. The European artists who traveled to India in the late 18th century found a fabulous world there of Indian princes, tremendously wealthy courts, and marvelous spectacles. And these sites they described in various um, paintings like this one of a dancing girl. The painting by Kettle is just one of a number of works being produced at this time that, that indicate India's popularity as an aesthetic concept um, and a popular subject in European oil painting. Many um, of, of 
the paintings by uh, these artists who traveled to India were sent back to England so they could be um, shown in various exhibitions. And of course, the dancing girl was an image that very neatly captured the, you know, the richness and the exoticism of India. Another of Tilly Kittle's Tilly Kettle's paintings is his portrait of Shuja Aldala. Um, this is one image that um, you will see later on was, was important in terms of marking the entry um, of late 18th century um, European uh, artists and visual forms into a dialogue and exchange with Indian artists in Ovid. <clears throat> This is probably the most remarkable of the kettle portraits from Faizabad. It shows Shuja al-Dalla on the right um, with his son and heir, Asaf al-Dalla. It was Asaf al-Dalla who um, moved the capital permanently to Lucknow in 1775. Um, he then commenced a, a grand building and patronage campaign that continued under his descendants um, and you know, completely transformed Lucknow's cityscape. This painting is now in the collection at Versailles, and the manner in which it happened is really quite interesting. Before Gentil departed for France, he borrowed four of Tilly Kettle's paintings from the Nawab so they could be copied for him by his own Indian artists. I mentioned that Gentil maintained his own atelier. <clears throat> he records in his memoirs that the, the four copies um, he had commissioned were indeed completed, but we can only trace one of these today. It's this painting um, that's now in uh, the Musée Guimet in Paris. This was painted by an artist named Navasi Lal, <clears throat> who was employed by Gentil on various projects, including um, that album uh, from the V&A that I showed you earlier. The, his artists were obviously adept in producing you know, works in different styles. Um, Gentil gifted this um, portrait by Navasi Lal to Louis XVI when he returned to France. And the original painting on which it was based is no longer extant. Um, returning to this Versailles painting, Gentil had also borrowed this painting from the Nawab in order to have it copied. He records in his memoirs that by the time the copy was completed, Nawab Shuja al-Dallah had fallen ill. Gentil visited him <clears throat> and he took the copy with him to show the Nawab, who at that time had, you know, by then had become his very close friend. The Nawab liked it so much that he wanted to keep it. When Shanti protested, the Nawab asked him, why do you need this picture? Isn't my portrait engraved upon your heart? <laughs> Shanti replied, yes, but how can I show you to my friends who cannot come here? He teased that if the Nawab liked the copy so much and wanted to keep it, then Shanti would take the original oil painting instead. And this is exactly what happened. The oil painting returned with him to France and was retained by Gentil's descendants until 1845, when it was sold to Louis Philippe, the French king responsible for turning Versailles into a museum. It was one of many acquisitions that um, Louis Philippe made uh, at this time. Uh, it, it was part of an endeavor to bring to Versailles all such artworks of, you know, relating to French personalities and French history, but there's no record of it ever having been displayed there. Images of the portrait copy um, by Navasi Lal, depicting Shuja al-Dalla and his ten sons, however, made their way across the globe. In France, the painting was reproduced in a print that was published in 1796. It was engraved by a father and son team um, with the name Renault. Just a few years later, the print was reproduced in a reverse glass painting made in China, in Canton, around 1800. The glass for such paintings was not actually manufactured in China and was exported there from Europe. The finished works were then sent back to Europe where a fashion had grown for Chinese-style rooms. Um, in which such paintings were, were, were displayed. Oddly, the fact that this reverse glass painting depicted an image of an, an Indian royal family seems not to have been a concern for whoever commissioned this Chinese reverse glass painting. Um, prints have a really extraordinary history in terms of multiplying and reflecting uh, Indian imagery. Um, I, I was struck by this not only through various incarnations of um, the kettle painting that I just showed you, 
Um, you know, but also as, as I was just sort of browsing through um, Lackman's collection uh, the other day. Many of you uh, may be familiar with Albrecht Dürer's famous image of a rhinoceros. This is his drawing dated uh, 1515 uh, of a rhinoceros that had arrived in Lisbon in 1513. Dürer based his drawing on a description and a sketch done by an unknown artist who had actually seen the animal. The rhinoceros had been presented as a gift to uh, a Portuguese ambassador by Sultan Muzaffar II, who he was then the ruler of Cambay, which is uh, in, the, in the modern state of Gujarat in Western India. The Portuguese ambassador then decided to present it to his king, Manuel I. The rhinoceros was kept in the king's menagerie for a couple of years and then was sent by Manuel as a gift to Pope Leo X. The ship that was transporting it sank off the northern Italian coast. Juror's drawing was uh, disseminated in woodcuts. Uh, his isn't an entirely accurate description of the rhinoceros, which it looks like it's really wearing, um, you know, real plated armor. But but his rendering had a, a, a remarkable longevity, even after more accurate images of um, the animal uh, became available. This is a faience tray of about 1750, manufactured in France, that indicates the persistence of Dürer's famous image well into the 18th century. Um, I'm going to return to you know, the subject of, of print imagery and, and its uh, importance to the dissemination of Lucknow imagery again later on. So I just thought I'd bring in this connection here. <clears throat> so let's return to Ovid in the late 18th century um, and the issue of early Nawabi patronage in the region. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, most evidence points to European patrons as a driving force for um, the emergence of a distinctive Avadi style. Uh, Shuja al Dalla, the third Nawab of, Av of Avad, um, you know, Janti's employer, his close friend, is the first Avadi ruler whose patronage can be discerned from surviving paint paintings. As, we, as we've seen through his employment of Tilly Kettle, he was very interested in European style portraiture, but he was also uh, heir to uh, the North Indian courtly painting uh, and portraiture tradition as well. This painting on the left of circa 1754 um, from Lucknow likely depicts a young Shuja al Dalla um, who spent his early years of rule in, um, at Lucknow, in fact. Like many early portraits from Ovid, uh, it's uninscribed. The general lack of inscriptions or dates um, on early Ovidi paintings is one of the reasons why um, it's been so difficult to determine the exact nature of Navadi, Nav Nawabi patronage and paintings chronology in the region. That uh, this painting depicts Shuja al Dalla is suggested by his distinctive attire, which consists of the green ceremonial robe with the fur-trimmed collar, uh, like the one he wears in the Versailles painting. Note, too, that he wears a, a very distinctive turban headband. This, uh, the painting on the left uh, actually ended up, again, um, in the collection of Shanti, and it's, you know, it's, it, it was included among the 14 albums of Indian paintings that um, he gave to um, uh, Louis the Sixteenth. Presumably, at some point, the Nawab had given it to him. <clears throat> Yet another early painting of Shuja al Dalla is this large and remarkable painting executed by the by um, the artist Mir Khalan Khan. In this painting, the Nawab is shown in uh, in the center uh, attacking a lion. It's uh, part of a, you know, the hunt, a hunt scene that takes place on, on a riverbank at Allahabad. The buildings in the distance are, are recognizable uh, as the Allahabad fort here and uh, another building known as a chalice satun. You can see that Shuja al Dalla's physiognomy corresponds you know, with that in his kettle portrait, uh, a, fuller, a full face and a drooping mustache. 
We also encounter this physiognomy in another roughly contemporary portrait from about 1759, um, from, from about 1759. This painting, interestingly, um, ended up in the collection of Antoine Pollier, who, uh, whose patronage we'll look at in depth um, later on. Um, maybe after the break, but I just want to make sure you, you're going to let me know, right? Okay. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, let's see. Mir Khan's Khan's painting shows Shuja al-Dawla as an active participant in the prerogatives of Indian rulership. The Hun scene uh, has close parallels in paintings that were made for the Mughal emperors. It was probably created no later than about 1765 when the Treaty of Allahabad was signed uh, because part of what was included in the terms of that treaty um, was the removal of Allahabad itself from the provinces of Avad, um, and it was uh, given to the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam. This painting is uh, one of the most, of the largest and most impressive uh, that Mir Khalan Khan produced, and it ended up in the collection of Robert Clive, who was one of the Treaty of Allahabad's negotiators. And you know, th this just goes to show how fluid the, the, the exchange and acquisition of Indian paintings was in the late 18th century. So this painting you know, really shows Mir Khan Khan working in, um, in, a, in a traditional style. But he was a hugely eclectic artist uh, who, exper who experimented with different, uh, different stylistic idioms this painting, for instance, um, shows his facility for combining different styles or seemingly different pictorial elements into a harmonious composition. Uh, the painting is in the David collection now. The seated female musician um, is really derived from Mughal models, but the seated couple here um, you know, are taken out of Persian painting. They're, they're, the treatment of their faces and even you know, the volumes of their figure and clothing are just entirely different from the seated figure next to them. Mir Khan um, you know, took an interest in Christian subject matter in various kinds of, of European subjects. Uh, he looked to Deccani models as well. This uh, is another one of his very notable works which um, which depicts just a village scene, but it's set against uh, you know, a fantastic background that's derived from uh, uh, Italian and Flemish landscape traditions. Mir Khan Khan was trained at uh, the imperial court of Muhammad Shah. He seems to have left the Mughal court around 1750, and he was one of the direct transmitters of the Mughal style to Avad. Both the village life in Kashmir, which I just showed you, and this um, lion hunt that we just saw with their receding vistas and their aerial perspectives are, are a direct result of Mughal painting traditions in the 17th century. Um, and these, you know, were in, these innovations were in response to uh, European prints and engravings that um, had entered the subcontinent. This painting in the British Library is attributed to Mir Khan Khan, um, you know, and it kind of shows another aspect of his eclecticism. It's a, it's a hybrid composition, you know, like the lovers in a landscape that I showed earlier. Uh, the hairstyle and the costume of the seated woman, for instance, um, are kind of European in flavor. She sits on an Indian chair. There's, uh, you know, definitely the setting, it, you know, is in line with. Uh, late 18th or early 18th century, you know, Mughal uh, terrace scenes. Um, and Mir Khan Khan, you know, also makes references here to some of his earlier paintings. Um, there's a, a painting in the uh, Foundation Custodia in Paris, um, which shows just a study 
of you know a fantastic boat attacked by a sea monster, and he you know has inserted it here as a little playful reference. This painting was in the collection of another very important uh, collector of Indian paintings, the East India Company official Richard Johnson. Richard Johnson served as assistant to the resident at Lucknow between 1780 to 82, and after returning to England in 1790, he sold his collection to the India office. So um, it, it, the, his collection is now preserved in the British Library, which took over that material. Um, it, the Johnson collection consisted of, consisted of hundreds of manuscripts and over a thousand paintings. And along with Colonel Polier, Johnson was probably one of the most active uh, colonial period collectors of Indian painting. Um, and we're going to go to break soon, but let me just show you this um, copy of the British Library painting, or one version of it, another version of it, um, that's in the Asian Art Museum collection. So there's, there's a lot of this that's happening at Lucknow around this time, and part of it, um, you, it, it there's a long-standing tradition, first of all, of this in but the, both the Rajput and the Mughal courts, you know, copying, you know, long established models. But there was also was an exchange uh, that, that happened between collectors of paint and patrons of painting at Lucknow that resulted in, you know, a, an enormous number of these um, that we find in albums associated with the province. So we'll pick up there after we come back. And <laughs>